I was born to a Muslim family, to parents who were very serious about teaching and encouraging their kids to, my brothers and I, to embrace our Islam and take it very seriously. And I took that encouragement and I really ran with it. So much so that um, in my teens and around 18, I had already read the Quran through numerous times. I developed a pretty good understanding uh, at an early age of Islam and uh, my, what man, mankind's place uh, in the great scheme of things and who Allah was and that he was a master of all, all creation and that we were simply his servants and we were to submit to him. And I, um, I, I really understood that he was simply that. He was so other than, than me, than human beings, that there was no connection with us other than master and servant. While he knew, he knew me through and through, I really couldn't know him. And um, it didn't bother me for a while. That just was perfectly fine with me as I kind of embraced my Islam and learned Islamic doctrine and theology and history uh, in my studies. And I took my Islam very seriously. I took it seriously because I wanted to preach to people I knew, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims uh, who were nominal, or the uh, atheists that I knew about Islam. I really believed in my heart that it was the truth, that God had revealed himself perfectly in this book through his very words in Arabic to mankind, and that this was the most perfect book ever written because God had written himself through Muhammad. And I wanted to give that to people uh, who didn't believe it or who didn't know it. I found myself during that time Engaging many people of different faiths, as I said, but the most staunch opposition came from Christians. They always gave me reasons for their belief, and that annoyed me. Didn't want, they didn't want people to give me good reasons for their beliefs. I began to study Christianity and read the Bible. I just wanted to see what, had, what it had to say so I had ammunition to use against Christians so I could uh, show them how true Islam was. And a verse popped up. I believe it's Luke 3.9. Think not to say to yourself that you have Abraham as your father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up sons of Abraham from the stones. Now, what that meant to me was, it isn't important where you came from. What's important is if, is, is, is if what you believe your whole life is true or not. And John the Baptist was speaking to me 2,000 years later, telling me, you know what, you're so interested in t uh, telling Christians and others why they're wrong. You better make sure you're right. And maybe they are too. And so I got a little bit more of an open mind. I wasn't by, by far, I was not a Christian. I had no intention of becoming a Christian. So I decided to do a comparative study between Christianity and Islam. Really to see what, what are the evidences for Islam and what are the evidences for Christianity. Now I had told, I said I, I had read the, the Quran numerous times through. And this verse, for some reason, that I've read numerous times, jumped out at me. And it meant something different to me this time. It's, uh, I believe it's uh, in, in a Ma'idah, it's verse, uh, it's, it, which is the fifth surah, verse 45 to 47. The Quran says, let the people of the book, meaning the people of the gospel, Christians, judge by what God has revealed in it. Let the people of the book judge by what God has revealed in it. Now that word for revealed, what he has revealed is a present tense verb. Now, what this means, really, is that there is a book that the people of the book follow. And if that command in Muhammad's day, in the 7th century, was to be taken seriously, that means that book had to exist, and it had to exist intact. It couldn't be a corrupt version, because Allah would never guide people to a corrupt, ver corrupt book for guidance. So now I have a dilemma. I've got to find out, is this book really that we have today, the gospel that Christians claim is the gospel today, is this the same as the gospel that existed in Saudi Arabia in Muhammad's day? Because if it is, I have to make a tremendous decision to follow this book now. Because the verse, the, the verse later in the Quran says that those who do not follow God's commands and his word are transgressors. And I didn't want to be a transgressor. I want to follow God's commands in his book. I began to look into some of the um, evidences for the transmission of the gospel as we have it today, of the Bible, and see what existed in Saudi Arabia at the time. And Muhammad spoke these words, um, <clears throat> and the Quran said these things. What was the evidence to show that it, it, it lasted or didn't last from, those, from that time on to now? 
And you know, from looking through the Dead Sea Scrolls, from examining the textual critical arguments of uh, the great German scholars who had always put down the Bible as being unreliable, and seeing that there's actually great evidence to show that the Bible that was uh, around in Muhammad's day is the same Bible we have today. In fact, the evidence is even better than that. Actually, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and the New Testament for sure, existed as we have it today, hundreds of years before the Quran uh, uh, was revealed to the Arabs in Saudi Arabia. Well, one day, my uh, good friend of mine who had become a Christian, he invited me to go to church. I've never been to church before, and I was at a state where I was kind of open to it. That morning, I was waiting for them to come pick me up, my friends. And uh, as is probably already obvious, I'm not the kind of guy who is very silent. I talk a lot, and uh, I can't control myself sometimes. But this morning, I was uncharacteristically silent. I was just somber. And I go to this church service, and I sit there, and my friends are asking me, what's wrong? What's the matter with you? Because they know, I'm just not talking. Something must be wrong. Well, I didn't say, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. I sat in the service and I had this experience that's common, uh, I understand, among Christians and even Muslims when they go to services, that the person speaking is speaking just to you. No one else is, in the, is there in the audience. Now this was a, probably a 2,000 seat church and I was wondering, did he know I was coming, this pastor? He doesn't know me. Well, he was speaking about how God has been knocking at the door your whole life and he won't force himself in. Jesus won't force himself into your life, but he'll lean against the door. And if you don't lean back, he'll flood your life. And he asked a question at the end of the service. Has God been knocking on your door? Has he been leaning on your door? And have you been leaning back? Are you getting tired of leaning? Maybe it's time to stop. And I got really irritated then. I didn't want to hear that, because it was too true. It was too close. And I left that service very upset. And I begin to hunch over, and I'm not given to emotional outbursts at all. It's not me. And for the first time I can ever remember, I openly sobbed in the parking lot. And I said out loud, I can't do it. It's too heavy. I can't hold it up anymore. And I assumed it was this burden of trying to wed Islam and Christianity so that I can, I can be comfortable in um, being on the fence. But it really was, I think was Jesus leading on the door, and I couldn't resist him any longer. I was trying too hard. So I decided to undertake to make it my job to study the scriptures, to study the evidence fully. And I did that over a course of months. And I can recall a time when I was sitting in my parents' den in their home, and I had, quite literally, all the evidence for Islam stacked up on one side of the, the desk. And my articles on Islam were shoved in the books from Islamic scholars. My notes were written on things. I had on this side of the desk all the books on Christianity and the resurrection of Jesus, which was I found to be the single point where I had to find out historically one's right, one's wrong on this. Either he raised from the dead or he didn't. And I had all this evidence swirling around me, and I was wondering, why is it I find this evidence for the resurrection so compelling? It's so um, convincing. Why won't I accept it? Why won't I accept it? What's wrong with my heart? What's wrong with my mind? What's wrong with this evidence? And then the, ev the answer walked by the door. My father walked by. And he looked at me and he smiled because he was so proud because I was studying. And he was approving. He knew, he thought I was studying to be a better Muslim and a better um, emissary for Islam. And I realized that's what it was. I couldn't break his heart. And that's why I kept away from the evidence, kept away from Jesus so long because I couldn't break his heart and hurt my mother or my brothers or the rest of my family. I couldn't do it. And I realized that I knew at that moment what truth cost would cost me, but I didn't know what it was worth. And this was truth. He did raise from the dead. But what did that mean for me? I didn't know that. And over the months, the Holy Spirit really worked on me to see this is not just a fact of history that I rose from the dead, meaning Jesus, of course, but that I rose from the dead is a fact of history, and that means that you, too, can have life. My crucifixion meant that you can have forgiveness for your sins because I paid the price, or because I live.
as the Bible says, you also should.